Hello everybody, I'm here and hopefully my videos look normal. I basically worked out there was a, a underlying problem that was causing the software I was using to not render things properly and I just decided to use a different software which is not caused too many issues and it should be pretty much identical and I could at this point re-render the video I did yesterday which was on Samantha B but I just thought at the end of the day I, I think a lot of people probably listen to these uh, more so than they watch them which is kind of I understand that because that's what I do uh, you know I very rarely watch a video if it's you know unless it's like a cooking video or something like that if it's just people talking I'm just going to listen to it so with that said I mean obviously the audio quality was not great but it was still uh, you know audible and therefore yeah basically I, I figured there was no point uploading it but hopefully this will be good quality so if you are somebody who likes to stare at your screen and just watch me talk well that's good uh, but I kind of don't want you to because you might notice how often the uh, visuals fall out of sync with the audio. Oh, speaking of. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about this article from the BBC. Uh, conversion therapy ban. Campaigners dismayed over delay. The original title for this was Conversion Therapy, Public to be Consulted Before Ban. Uh, instead, it's, you know, Campaigners dismayed over delay. I don't know why they made that change. I'm not sure if they changed the actual substance of the article. But... Uh, I think it shouldn't make too much of a difference. And yeah, I'm just going to kind of cover basically what it's talking about. But on the gay point, I'll try to be quick, but I do think there's a point that needs to be made. And I think also it's kind of a funny irony relating to uh, gender identity extremism that I want to point out too. So yeah, basically the conservatives are in power. They have a renewed mandate with the uh, local elections. And the first thing they seem to have come out and done is said, all right, we're going to ban conversion therapy now which is kind of weird because they were delaying it as this thing points out and they delayed it until after the local election results so maybe they actually realized that people would have criticisms of this and that therefore it wouldn't be a good idea i'm not sure but definitely i think this is one of those laws where it's a very good litmus test for whether or not you're somebody who really thinks out the implications of a law or if you're somebody who just supports a law because it sounds nice uh, yeah, I think basically the minute you really start thinking about this, you realize there are potentially a lot of problems and that you should be kind of concerned because this is one of those laws where they can sneak in a lot of dodgy stuff and it's going to be really hard to oppose it because people are going to come out and go, oh, so you support conversion therapy. You know, it's, it's a classic uh, Trojan horse, a really easy way to create quite serious limits to uh, free speech and a lot of kind of freedom issues in general. Also to, to really harm people who might suffer from gender dysphoria and things like that while wrapping it up in the label of being opposed to conversion therapy. And if you have some kind of issue with these laws, then you yourself must also be a, a fan of conversion therapy. And obviously that is uh, completely manipulative and uh, is going to really stifle the debate, which does need to happen around this issue. And unfortunately, I do think the debate around this issue is going to be uh, significantly hindered. And I think that's going to make it much easier for uh, the law to basically be worse than it should in terms of, again, mostly uh, issues relating to the freedom of the individual. So the point I want to make on gay conversion therapy specifically is basically uh, addressed with this part of the article here. Uh, the government has said the short consultation will be held before the legislation is published, asking the public and interested parties how best to address the problem while still protecting the medical profession, defending freedom of speech, and upholding religious freedom. Okay, so that's kind of promising. It also said it wants legitimate forms of pastoral support to be allowed to continue, including prayer to help someone exploring their sexual orientation or gender identity. The Evangelical Alliance, which represents 3,500 churches, said it welcomed the consultation process. We want to avoid the situation where a person can be accused of conversion therapy for praying with someone who freely chooses and asks for prayer, Peter Linus, the group's UK director, said. Now, I'm just gonna jump straight into this. This is from the Gay Times an alternative kind of viewpoint. So Jane Ozan, a former member of the government's LGBT advisory panel and gay evangelical Christian, said she's relieved to hear that measures will be brought forward to ban conversion therapy. However, the government risks creating a highly dangerous loophole if it chooses to focus purely on coercive practices, she said. So what you basically have here is the government saying that they are going to continue to allow people to talk openly about this issue, to allow people to actually engage in dialogue about this issue, and also for churches to continue to uh, have a pastoral role in uh, you know, talking to people about their sexuality. Uh, but then you have 
these um, ad- advocates and activists who are coming out and saying, actually, that shouldn't be allowed. And it shouldn't just be coercive things. It should be uh, anything, even things which people are kind of engaged in free, open discussion. Now, the one thing I do want to point out, which I think is very funny, is what a lot of uh, uh, gender identity extremists and other trans activists have been saying, which is that you, if you are same-sex attracted, or indeed opposite sex attracted, if you are attracted to somebody based on their sex, then you need to unlearn your genital preferences. You know, I think we've all heard that line. You know, you've got to unlearn your genital preferences uh, because it's transphobic. And I would say, you know, okay, we're talking about religious exemptions and things like that. But it is just as much uh, kind of a sense of, oh, you shouldn't have this attraction to say that uh, lesbians shouldn't just be attracted to people without penises because that's a genital preference. Uh, so I, I think it will be interesting to see whether we have a situation where if you go to a you know Catholic church and you walk into the confession and you admit to, say, a same-sex uh, experience, you know, same-sex sexual experience, uh and then you're told to, you know, take, you know, however many Hail Marys or whatever, that might be considered as, uh, illegal because that's conversion therapy. But uh, if you, you know, stand up in a university or, or at a rally or something and talk about how lesbians need to unlearn their genital preferences, that's considered completely legitimate. Uh, I think that that is an irony which or an inconsistency, which I think we can realistically expect. Because if you think about it, you know, if we're talking about conversion therapy as simply being trying to uh, influence somebody to abandon their same-sex attraction, then uh, what could be a more obvious contemporary example of that than than all of the uh, trans activists who are out there saying, if you are only attracted to members of the same sex, you need to stop that because you know that's genital, that's being a genital fetishist and that's trans exclusionary. I can't think of a more obvious example of that. And yet I'm guaranteeing nobody's going to call that uh, conversion therapy. So I think that's a really uh, kind of funny thing to consider. And I I just think that kind of is is an interesting bit of context to conclude on. You know, there are a lot of uh, progressive activists who want to make it so you can't make any decisions in your own mind about what ethically you consider the right thing. You can't uh, engage in any sort of theological exploration of what may or may not be right, you know, and and have a conversation with a pastor about that kind of issue. Uh, But apparently you can be told that uh, you are a a transphobic uh, bigot for only being attracted to people of the same sex. And that will not be considered conversion therapy. And I, I, I imagine it will never be considered conversion therapy by the progressives who are pushing to ban conversion therapy because they are basically hypocrites and they're inconsistent. And I don't think this is about uh, freedom for uh, same-sex attracted people. I do think this is, uh, in, to a significant degree, about control. Uh, you know, and that's kind of my belief. And I think the fact that they are so annoyed at the prospect of loopholes because you know the the idea of conversion therapy isn't sufficiently vague. Uh, is a very big indication that they just want to be able to control people and control people's thoughts and control people's minds. Uh, and I think that's not very good. And yeah, certainly the fact that they're, they're going to make an exception for when they want to control people's minds, you know, with the whole uh, genital fetishist thing and how you need to unlearn your, your genital preferences and unlearn your preferences for the same sex, uh, they're definitely going to be making an exception for that. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about their motivations. Now, when it comes to gender identity, I just want to cover this uh, kind of line here. The Royal College of Psychiatrists said it would be taking part in the consultation to highlight why conversion therapy is both unacceptable and harmful and to ensure clinicians can still help people fully explore their gender identity where appropriate. The ban, which was first pledged in 2018, is set to include both sexuality and gender identity in its definition and will protect people from coercive and abhorrent practices. And then obviously it continues on to the religious freedom thing. But I think, you know, this was worth addressing, uh, you know, next. But one I wanted to cover, which uh, I have covered previously in the video, but it's possible you haven't seen that. The video was on um, Philosophy Tube. But yeah, I'll just cover it here as well. Why it is that you shouldn't include same-sex attraction with gender identity. And here's a very simple reason, okay? Same-sex attraction does not require any kind of medical intervention at all, Uh, you know, and that is a a big thing, okay? Uh, If I have a a gay child or anything else, then I do not have to seek out any medical intervention for that child at all. That child is completely able to just live their lives uh, and not have any problems, 
uh, you know, they can live their lives, you know, settle down with, uh, uh, you know, somebody of the same sex and, you know, get married or whatever, adopt kids, I don't mind. Basically, there is no need for any kind of therapy, any kind of counseling, uh, any kind of surgery. It is pretty simple. Now, for that reason, I think it, it's the real reason why when you're talking about uh, gay conversion therapy, it's such a harmful thing because you are taking something which is not a medical issue uh, and you are turning it into one by acting as if it needs this kind of therapy. Uh, and that's, I think, really the, the big problem with gay conversion therapy. And obviously, when you look at uh, people being trans, it's a different issue entirely. Because think about it, okay, if if my, let's say, daughter, because I think a lot of young children, I think that's the real issue we need to focus on here, kind of young children, uh, a lot of young children, it's uh, women, girls, uh, identifying as men. So if my daughter decides that she is a man, then I am quite likely to be expected to put her on puberty blockers with a, an anticipation that she will eventually go on testosterone. And who knows, it's possible by the time, you know, I've got a daughter who's that sort of age, maybe there'll be laws now where you can actually put children on, on testosterone. I hope not. I actually think that there is a reason to be positive that at least in the UK, things will actually be much better by the time I'm older. But there is a chance with things like this that, you know, we, we could be going in the wrong direction. If that's the case, who knows, maybe uh, it will be expected that I put a, a very my very young daughter on uh, testosterone uh, and possibly even, you know, surgery to, to do things like that. Uh, you know, and, and these are all things which... Uh, will, you know, be be expected of me as somebody with a trans-identified uh, daughter, who, of course, everyone else would consider to be my son. Uh, now, the the other thing is, of course, I, I would also perhaps be expected to send them to a, a gender identity cl uh, clinic where they will learn about, you know, being a, a boy and what it means to be a boy and, you know, learn about how they, they do have the boy essence inside of them and obviously be exposed to a bunch of uh, sexist, regressive stuff that is completely based in stereotypes, uh, you know, and about, you know, living like a boy and all that sort of nonsense. Uh, now, here's the thing, okay. Maybe, let's say I have the freedom to say, no, I'm not going to do any of that. You know, she's my daughter. I'm not going to do any of that. But if my daughter is in distress, if my daughter is anxious, if she, uh, you know, basically has kind of this obsessive compulsion over the fact that she should be a boy, I'm not going to want to look at that. I'm not going to want my daughter to be anxious. Uh, so what am I going to want to do? Well, I'm going to want to take my daughter to therapy. Of course I am, because I care about her. Of course I'm going to want to take her to therapy. But obviously what have we established? I don't want to send them to a, a gender clinic. I don't want to send her to uh, anywhere like that. So what do I do? Well, I'll send her to a therapy that uh, will also affirm the reality of her biology, a therapy that will help her to basically overcome her feelings that she was born in the wrong body. Because of course, who wouldn't, you know, of course you should try to overcome that, you know, in the exact same way that I, as somebody with an anxiety disorder, uh, went to therapy to overcome a lot of the anxious feelings I was having. And, you know, part of that was overcoming the root cause of that anxiety, which was the precise thoughts and feelings that I was getting anxious over. In the exact same way, of course, if somebody is getting anxious and depressed over the belief that they were born in the wrong body, uh, over the idea that they're actually uh, secretly a boy because they have a magic boy essence in them, one of the things, if you're going to deal with that and make that person mentally healthy again, one of the things you're going to have to do is confront the uh, false notion they have in their head and actually help them to realize that that notion is complete nonsense. That that will be illegal. You know, what I just described there, uh, 100% what I would do out of compassion for my daughter, if she was going through this, would would almost certainly be illegal. Uh, you know, and it, I mean, it says that they're going to try to ensure clinicians can still help people fully explore their gender identity where appropriate. Um, the extreme progressives, the gender identity extremists, honestly, you know, a lot of the trans activists, they're going to say, you know, maybe they'll say, oh, where appropriate, but where appropriate, it's, it's never going to be appropriate. 
It's never going to be appropriate to have an honest, open discussion about a child's gender identity in any way that allows for the possibility that maybe this whole idea of being born in the wrong body and having magical man and woman essences or boy and girl essences is wrong. It's never going to be appropriate. Uh, you know, they're going to say, oh, you know, because that's what they said. And that's what I said when I was talking about philosophy tube. It's what I'll say now. Their attitude is not that they don't think that uh, trans identified people should be sent to therapy. They do. They just think it should be their therapy, their medical intervention. It's and that's why, again, did, have I said this yet? It's about control. It's about making it so, you know, you don't have any power to oppose this. And it's really harmful, really gross. Uh, I really hate it. Um, and yeah, that's th- that's it. They they are going to try to make it so what I just described there is illegal. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, I think having this, this gender identity thing in there, it, it just should not be there. Because I think the reality is that, sure, you know, are there harmful ways that you can try to get somebody to abandon their belief in, you know, uh, gender identity extremism in this idea that identifying as a man or a woman or a boy or a girl makes you a boy or a girl. Are there harmful ways you can do that? Of course, there's harmful ways you can get somebody to believe anything, or there's harmful ways you can get somebody to abandon a belief in anything. Uh, anything can have a harmful way of going about it. But uh, the important thing to bear in mind is that uh, gender identity extremism is also harmful. You know, uh, it's harmful uh, for the rights of same-sex attracted people, it's harmful for the rights of women. Uh, it's harmful more generally for society because it is about trying to uh, push away the, an acceptance of reality. Oh, it's also harmful for our democratic traditions based in freedom of speech and the ability to talk about things openly and honestly. Uh, and of course, it's harmful for the children themselves who are being pushed through this. And we've seen the, the detransitioners. How many more detransitioners do you think there are going to be uh, who you know are, were kind of persuaded of this thing Uh, as young children and then it was literally illegal to try and talk them out of it to try and actually you know entertain the idea that maybe hey maybe you're not uh uh you know actually trans maybe maybe you don't actually have a magic boy essence inside of you uh how many more detransitions are there going to be when it could potentially become illegal to entertain the idea that maybe they're not actually trans because i mean the thing is again I'm talking about actually from a kind of sending a child to somewhere that is maybe a bit more explicitly opposed to gender identity extremism. But what about somebody who's just neutral? What about somebody who says, you know what, there is such a thing as being authentically transgender, but not everybody who thinks they're transgender is necessarily transgender. You know, that that's what I would kind of call the neutral position. Uh, you know, they think actually, you know, there is such a thing as, you know, trans people and trans women and women and all that kind of stuff, but not all uh, self-identified trans women are in fact trans women. You know, that's kind of a neutral position. Well, even that could become illegal because imagine, you know, somebody, I'm sorry, I touched my microphone. Somebody comes to, a, a young child goes to, you know, this neutral clinic and the neutral clinic says, what we're going to do is try to find out whether or not you're actually trans. You know, uh, well, what are they going to have to do? Well, they're going to have to, in order to try and find out whether or not a young child is actually trans, they're going to have to explore the idea that maybe they aren't actually trans. And that's oh, conversion therapy. You know, oh, you're, you're trying to suggest this child they're not really trans. You're trying to deny this child's identity. You're trying to use this therapy, this, you know, open, honest discussion about gender identity to uh, suggest that the child might not actually be trans. Your you, conversion therapy. Do you, do you, does anyone think that that's not what these gender identity extremists and these trans activists are going to be trying to do? And, and that that's the narrative that they're going to try to push? Because that's what they're going to do. It, it 100% is. And I, I genuinely think if you watch me, I think you, you know that I'm right. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, and it's, it's dangerous and it's bad for society and it's bad for children. And yet, yeah, it's it's what they're going to do. And I don't have any doubt about that. So basically, I, I guess, here's the thing. What do we need to do? Well, there is going to be this consultation. And I'm hoping, you know, I don't think I have the ability to influence this that much, unfortunately. You know, I don't, I'm not part of a, an official organization. I'm not part of a, a group. Um, and, you know, 
if uh, I don't know what group I can actually be part of, you know, the main group I know of in the UK is the LGB Alliance, and I wouldn't feel uncomfortable uh, joining that thing as I'm not uh, LGB. But, you know, ho hopefully there are people who are going to try to stand up for this. But of course, you know what's going to suck? There are people who are going to stand up for this, stand up for the rights of children, stand up for the rights of parents, stand up for the basic freedom of speech and uh, freedom of thought. Uh, and those people are going to be called bigoted and regressive, and they're going to be accused of, you know, trying to hold back the UK. And it's going to really suck. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think it is interesting that, you know, we're just off the back of the Conservatives winning in the local election. And now, you know, literally less than a week later, we're uh, looking down the barrel of this situation and, you know, how terrible this could be for so many people in this country. And I think it does show that this isn't a problem that can be solved with party politics. This is a problem that is going to be solved through uh, generally trying to actually change a lot of the, the narrative around this and the discussion around this. And I think this is a classic example because you can't even, you can't just talk about issues. You can't just talk about ideas. You have to confront the fact that the very language being used to discuss these ideas, you know, conversion therapy and things like that is uh, inherently rigs the game against uh, people who, you know, actually care about protecting children and things like that. So yeah, basically that's the end of the video. Uh, if you, uh, liked what I had to say, then, you know, like, um, or if you just liked that there was a discussion and like, if you disagree with some of what I had to say, then do comment below, uh, share this video if you thought it was interesting and, uh, also subscribe if you want to see more. And finally, obviously people who give on Patreon is really appreciated. Um, and you know, I'm trying to make more videos get back to like m you know multiple videos a week uh which obviously i kind of have not quite been able to do over the last few weeks so yeah uh thank you for patron and i'll just say thank you to my current patrons hannah kirsten stephen nancy rubble lizzie jessica constant adriana harper alex like jane george katie ryan vishnuvia snap feminist lily emily Frederico, Evan, Philip, Anna, Sophie, Jamie, Lena, Julie, Dustin, Rashmi, Marion, BJ, Joshua, Marina, Sam, Sarah, Valerie, Kathleen, Jelena, Dork, Alexandra, Emma, Christina, Owen, Sarah, Ibishka, Chris, Clara, Amy, Gifkia, Sarah, Corey, Aaron, Grape, Rays, Janet, Vince, Colin, Radia. You're all very appreciated.